Now, as a signature country to the WHO, you are required to inform the WHO if any new unusual disease outbreaks occur. Uh, this is an international health regulation, an IHR. Unfortunately, a lot of countries aren't doing this, or they try to minimize it or hide it uh, until it, it's... We miss critical, critical days in preparing for this thing. And uh, the, uh, this happened in SARS. This was kept under cover for several weeks. And it's happened with the, uh, the outbreak in China. Once the virus gains access to the international air traffic system, passenger traffic, uh, then it disseminates, as we've seen, very, very widely. Through the eyes of virologist and professor of medicine, Dr. Stephen Hatfill, how is the Chinese Communist Party's weeks-long cover-up of coronavirus, or CCP virus, contributed to the global pandemic? What are the likely origins of the virus? What structural problems have inhibited the U.S. response? And how serious is CCP virus in the U.S. really? Through the eyes of an expert, what's in store for the near future? In this episode, we sit down with Dr. Stephen Hatfill, a physician, virologist, bioweapons expert, and adjunct assistant professor of emergency medicine at George Washington University Medical Center. He has studied Ebola, Marburg, and monkeypox viruses at the U.S. Army Institute for Infectious Diseases. And he is the co-author of the prescient book on pandemics, Three Seconds Until Midnight. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. Dr. Stephen Hatfield, so wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Nice, nice to be here with you, Jan. So, Dr. Hatfield, you, you're an expert in disaster planning, in epidemic response, in a whole range of issues. You've written this book, Three Seconds to Midnight, um, which essentially, as far as I can tell, predicts what we're seeing right now with coronavirus, although you were expecting it with influenza, but I don't think that's uh, uh, as relevant here. Um, why don't you tell me, how did you know when you published this book in November what was going to happen? Uh, we spent about 10 years looking at this. Um, we, The country, the United States, didn't have a... Uh, a plan really for any pandemic respiratory virus until uh, 2005 when George Bush uh, put one into place. It was a preliminary plan. There was a lot of fanfare about it. But it was the first time somebody had outlined what the various segments of the federal government were going to do. And Health and Human Services very quickly uh, within within weeks, had taken this and put some meat on the bones and uh, gave it a body. And that plan was a very careful delineation on what the federal government was responsible for, what the states were responsible for, and what the mayors of our towns and cities, our local authorities, were responsible for. And it outlined it in extreme detail. Uh, all that was, and here's what you need to do if you're a local authority to prepare. Here's what you do if you're a state governor to prepare. Here's what you do and what the federal government is going to do should one of these events happen. So it was all very carefully outlined. All that was missing was the crayons to color in the pictures. There were checklists, there were everything. The federal government has kept its task to the American people. It is met and it is doing all of its responsibilities. There were some snags starting out. Yeah, there were. But this is moving at a speed we have not seen since World War II with regards to industrial mobilization. The states partially did what they were supposed to do. Some states were better than others. Some states were excellent. 
but that is to take items from the national stockpile and distribute it to the local authorities, to modify any rules regarding volunteer liability, uh, the use of alternate care sites, modified standards of care for the state in a, in a severe pandemic, these type of things. And then, unfortunately, most of the local authorities um, did very little. Some, some did very well. Don't get me wrong, but the majority uh, failed. They didn't stockpile. They didn't make plans uh, to have a surge medical capability. That is, increased numbering of beds, of healthcare personnel, this type of thing. Uh, there was no stockpiling of critical basic items and an inventory to control that stockpile. Uh, it's just they took federal money to help them, but nothing seemed to uh, to get done. And this whole concept of emerging disease became more prominent. This started in the mid-90s when we started to see all these, well, infections previously unknown to medical science. And it started to incur with an increasing frequency. And a lot of us thought we were imagining this until a few very seminal papers came out that went back historically and looked over the last hundred years. And it turns out it's not the fact we were getting better at identifying new diseases. It's the fact that new infectious diseases were indeed jumping from animals into man with an increasing frequency. And right now, some scientists are predicting anywhere from 10 to 40 new uh, pathogenic animal viruses are going to jump into man over the next 20 years. And we, we have no idea how lethal uh, these new agents will be. Uh, you have to sort of plan for the worst, and if it doesn't occur, be pleasantly surprised. When the SARS epidemic in 2003 made its way through the world. It wasn't the end thing. It really wasn't anything anyone was expected. Our social distancing measures and, and control measures were able to quickly keep it under control. By this, I mean case contact tracing. So you have a patient, they fit a clinical definition, you go by and you quarantine everyone they've had close contact with uh, for so many days. And this, this really did, it made it to Ottawa and a couple places. Uh, Singapore did an excellent job, uh, Hong Kong as well, of getting this firmly under control. Um, that was our warning. We needed to improve our surveillance. We needed to improve our surveillance above what the WHO was doing. Now, as a signature country to the WHO, you are required to inform the WHO if any new unusual disease outbreaks occur. Uh, this is an international health regulation, an IHR. Unfortunately, a lot of countries aren't doing this, or they try to minimize it or hide it. Uh, until it, it's, we, we miss critical, critical days in preparing for this thing. And uh, the, uh, this happened in SARS. This was kept under cover for several weeks. And it's happened with the, uh, the outbreak in China. Once the virus gains access to the international air traffic system, passenger traffic, then it disseminates, as we've seen, very, very widely. So this concept of emerging disease, we were expecting something like this to happen. And uh, it was necessary to go back over the respiratory pandemic plan and, uh, and uh, make an assessment of where were the bottlenecks, what needed to be done, how can we approve it, all the way from surveillance of new events 
to the major megacity region responses. And uh, we tried to offer some solutions to get the ball rolling, but there didn't seem to be a lot of interest at the time. So Dr. Hatfill, um, I actually have so many questions for you actually about the U.S. response and some more details about the coronavirus itself. But since you mentioned China, let's talk about China first. Um, okay, first of all, there's even some discussion about this. Is it certain that the virus originated in China? I think so, as certain as it can be. Uh, the coronaviruses in the southern part of, of uh, the nation, of China, uh, there's a lot of bats. And coronaviruses have been isolated from these bats. There's, I think there are up to 400 different coronaviruses out there. And uh, these serve as your reference samples. So when you do have an outbreak, it makes it fairly easy to find one of these bat coronaviruses that's, that it closely matches. And then, as with any emerging disease, it, the virus by itself and its natural environment may not be enough to jump into man. There's a learning phase that the virus has to go through to adapt to human biochemistry. And this can often be done by passage through a second species of mammal. Um, one of the current thoughts, one of them, is that this had passed from horseshoe bats into uh, the pangolin. The pangolin is kind of a creepy little animal. <laughs> it's an anteater type thing with long claws. But it has scale. It's a mammal, but it has scales all over the outside of its body. And a real long tail, it likes to roll into a round ball if it feels threatened. Well, these are considered a delicacy in some parts of the world, and they're actually endangered animals. But these live markets, and um, Asian countries, uh, the people like their food very fresh. So um, grandma will go shopping in the morning, and um, they'll, they'll kill the item right then and there at the live market and then bring it home, and it's consumed virtually the same day. Um, this is, this is it's tradition. And um, the live markets are where you have a lot of different animal species crammed into cages next to each other. And, of course, viruses can traffic from any of the sick animals to other species and they make a species jump into something else. And in that animal, they become better adapted. Um, and kind of the golden rule I use, if you find the same virus in more than two species of mammal, then that virus is a risk for jumping into man and becoming eventually very efficient at person-to-person -person transmission. So again, so many questions, <laughs> Dr. Hatfield. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of rumors around that this could have been some sort of vaccine research that escaped from the nearby P4 bio lab in Wuhan or possibly even a bioweapon, things like that. Um, you're, it sounds to me like you're saying it most likely originated in this wet market. No, it didn't originate in the wet market. We think, I personally think it originated further south. Um, you capture these animals to eat, you have to transport them to market. Every, all these different species go in the back of a truck. We know that the virus did, did have a genetic change while it was at the market. Um, the BL4 lab, the biosafety level four lab, uh, BSL, I mean, that is kilometers away from this wet market. It's not like next door or anything. It's clear across town. And um, the samples that are used in these things, the French built the laboratory. And um, I believe the French, the French are in and out of there all the time, is my understanding. And you only keep very small quantities of this stuff around in 
uh, tiny, tiny little plastic vials that are kept in liquid nitrogen. Um, it's, it's, the research is done very carefully. Uh, nothing gets out of that place. Um, any of those labs. They're, everything is sterilized before it comes out or treated. And, um, you know, you're in an encapsulating suit, so your chances of catching something are almost zero. Um, and should you tear your suit or something like this, there's a whole protocol you go through. You go into a slammer. You go into a confined, a quarantine. And uh, yourself for many days. So the, the, the chances of it coming from something like that out of the laboratory into a humid environment with lots of uh, moisture in the air. These things don't survive very long as an aerosol. They decay fairly quickly. Indoors, now outdoors, they, or sorry, outdoors, they decay very quickly. The ultraviolet light damages them. Oxygen in the atmosphere rusts them, if you want to call it that. And the moisture in the air exerts um, osmotic effects. Um, like when you put salt on a slug when you were a kid and they shrivel up. Uh, it exerts forces that tear the virus apart or try to tear the virus apart. So when you look at the genome of the virus, it doesn't look like it's been tampered with in any way intentionally. And we can follow these mutations all the way back to the first recognized case, which was a long ways away from, from uh, uh, the city, to the people in the market. And then from there uh, to the cases. And even there now, you can see the different clades the ones that went to Europe, the ones that went to North America, um, the ones that spread further through Asia. And you can follow all this stuff like a detective. So the chance of this being an accident and, um, or an intentional event, uh, is anything possible? Well, essentially anything is possible. But the chances of this are about the square root of zero. So, Dr. Hatfield, you mentioned earlier that uh, the Chinese Communist Party wasn't very forthcoming with information. I'm wondering if you could trace that for me and also what the costs of that were. Well, from what I understand, there were cab drivers sending tweets to each other. Uh, the cab drivers are very smart people, by the way. They have a pulse on the city at any one time. And the cab drivers were becoming alarmed and they were talking to each other. Now this had been reported uh, because the Chinese media swooped down on these guys and uh, did whatever they did so they'd stop talking about it. Um, there's possibilities this may have actually been occurring in November and a few people think maybe it's uh, October over there. Um, it's possible with any virus to get a subclinical infection. In other words, you've been exposed to enough of the virus that you make antibodies that activate your immune system, but you don't become overtly ill. And as we've learned over the last sort of 50 years, sort of each pathogen has its own critical minimum infective dose. And if you're exposed to a number of viruses below that minimal infective dose, then you tend to develop an immunity and, and uh, your body handles it. Above the minimally infective dose, we usually try to talk about this as a population, so 50% above that minimal infective dose uh, will catch 
and go on to develop the actual disease. So um, basically, this is where it, it stands. Um, this could have been lurking around for a long time without anyone aware of it and without people really becoming overtly sick or dying of something else or misdiagnosis. Remember, we had a flu epidemic going on as well, and there was a, uh, a bee influenza strain involved, which was pretty rough on humans. So how many of these flu strains got um, misdiagnosed or improperly diagnosed when it was actually a coronavirus infection? So that could have happened as well. Whatever it is, we lost valuable time. So on, uh, I think it was January 14th, uh, the WHO, based on data that it had been given by the Chinese regime, um, announced that there was a very, very limited, if, if any, human-to-human uh, -human transmission of coronavirus. Um, what, what do you make of that announcement? Well, I think a lot of virologists, I can't speak for everyone. Personally, I looked at it with some degree of suspicion. Um, if it was using the same receptor as SARS, that was sort of a background model. And because of the original SARS problem with China in 2003, it was best to be pessimistic about what they were announcing. Um, and time would tell. And time did tell. This was, from the time in the wet market, uh, this virus seemed to be transmitting more readily to humans and from human to human. So... In that case, and if it was combined with a level of the population that really weren't showing overt symptoms, then it falls into the realm of it was impossible to understand what was going on, and this should have been communicated. That said, the Chinese moved with remarkably uh, urgency and speed to develop a rapid PCR diagnostic test, a DNA-based test. The viral RNA is changed to DNA and it's amplified and labeled. And you can have results within a few hours. Uh, they also sequenced, they took apart the blueprints of the virus in painstaking detail. Uh, they really, really moved with speed with that, and that allowed them to do the PCR testing. So we thought, okay, well, we're not going to get alarmed yet. We were worried about the population densities of Wuhan and the potential for it to spread, but uh, people were sort of sitting and watching this, and uh, then it exploded. So... That's sort of the timeline, that period of concern. Um, there should have been uh, a request for assistance early when you could see that this was going to, to ramp up. And things like border closures and this and that, these are still debatable measure, measure, measures in the scientific literature, but they certainly proved their value this time. Um, it was just very slow response, and uh, I'm still not sure I trust their fatality figures and their total number of infection. Uh, I think those are, and that's my opinion, but I think they're artificially low. When this thing was developing and you saw the different graphs come up and plateau, they were a little too perfect. So I still don't trust the final data. I could be wrong. Well, I appreciate you, you sharing that. Now, there's been uh, a bit of discussion about, you know, the impact of this suppression of information on 
affecting the global pandemic. Some people have said that, that it's precisely what allowed it to expand this way. There's been some papers written that if we had known weeks earlier, uh, it would have the level of uh, infection or transmission would have been reduced dramatically. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, there's some data that dates back to 1918 to the great influenza pandemic that arguably killed 100 million people. It came around in three waves. The first wave was infectious, but uh, not a lot of deaths. And then the second wave came through, and there was a significant increase in mortality. And they didn't know about viruses in 1918. They knew there was something that couldn't be seen with a microscope. But the concept of the virus really hadn't taken the forefront in medicine. That took until after World War II, really, uh, for uh, the electron microscopes and this type of thing to be developed so we could actually see these infectious agents. Um, the big thing about it was when you don't have a vaccine and when you don't have a drug that's effective at treating it, your only recourse is the thousand-year-old technique of social distancing. Don't get too close to anyone. And case contact tracing, quarantining the people that were around the original case and quarantining the people that were around the people that were around them. You see what I mean? It, it goes down the chain. And you try to stop transmission that way. And there's a very, very narrow window for where these measures become effective. Let's say for one person in a modern day, you may have 70, up to 70 or more chances to transmit your infection to someone else during a normal working day. Well, that's 70 people public health authorities have to track down, identify, find, interview, and if there's a test, test, or home quarantine them for, for a little bit. You can see how this quickly gets out of control. You just simply don't have the number of healthcare workers to do this. And you're forced to lock everybody down. Um, this is what happened. So every day is sort of precious to, to get countermeasures ready. Uh, this is when the local authorities start taking their final inventory, making sure they have what they need, just in case it gets over here. Looking at the projections from the disease experts, okay, uh, looking at the case histories of the patients that have had it in China, uh, we knew we would need some ventilators if it got over here. How many? So having the infrastructure in place, and th this takes pre-planning. Our major cities have had 15 years to pre-plan for an event like this. They were told by some of the top scientists in the world that this is going to happen. We're living under population densities that are unnatural. In fact, no other large species of mammal, of mammal, large species, has ever achieved these population densities before. We're all living in a biological experiment, if you will. Public health in the 21st century has to be ranked up there with the level of national defense. This is a strategic issue. There's very few things that can interrupt a nation from making uh, goods and providing services and national defense to its people than uh, an infectious disease pandemic. So this has to be treated as part of national defense. We, we have a president that realized that about a year ago, 
before this this even started, uh, the president realized that we had lost our vaccine manufacturing capability. Uh, the businesses had, had taken it overseas to China. And he had signed legislation into effect uh, to bring not only that capability back to the United States, but to use the latest technologies, cell culture methods, and, and have the ability to ramp up to very, very quickly make a new vaccine uh, should a new pathogen appear. And, you know, I applaud him for the foresight of that. The federal government has been stockpiling, partially as a result of biological warfare defense, but dual use for a pandemic. The government's been stockpiling items since 2000, the early 2000s. It's a strategic national stockpile just for events like this that it could disseminate to the states and the states could disseminate it to the local authorities. But there's not a ventilator for every person in the United States. That's crazy. So it has to be a rehearsed system in our local authorities of when they get the go, have your sites for alternate hospitals pre-identified, buildings of opportunity, you don't have to use army tent hospitals. Um, high schools make, uh, they have enough facilities if they have a cafeteria, make very good alternate care centers. But you have to handle this medical surge, this number of cases. And if you can successfully do that and keep it below your maximum amount your doctors, nurses, and healthcare system can handle, then you're free to work on all the other things that go along with a pandemic. And uh, the local authorities have been running since day one. And I'm sorry, I, I don't want to be overly critical, but I can't see where some things have done anything to prepare. And then you ask the federal government to bail you out federal government stockpiled. They're rapidly working as fast as they can towards a vaccine. They're rapidly working towards drug therapy. In fact, most of our drug manufacturing is in China. We're rapidly trying to get that back as a nation, an endogenous capability, at least for our critical drugs. Um, I've never seen, I, I'm from the outside, I'm just looking in. But I've never seen things happen this quick in my life, especially with the government. So it's absolutely phenomenal what's been going on. People aren't aware of this. It's the cities that aren't prepared or they have strange plans or revelations that, oh, yeah, well, we need to do this. Uh, yeah, we need the hospital you know, ships. Government's trying to accommodate. But the government can't do everything for everybody. There are limits. Does that kind of make sense? It does. You know, the administration has been criticized, actually, for being too slow to realize the severity. Um, your thoughts? Too slow? I've never seen things move so quick in my life. Uh, I, my mouth hangs open out of amazement at how fast the federal government has responded to this. I'm also thrilled how U.S. manufacturing has responded. You know, our companies are coming forward. What can I do? What can I make? How can I help? Um, it, it's just phenomenal. It, it, it brings your American spirit back in a huge fashion. But this virus is moving very quickly. Modern air travel has ensured modern transportation, not just air. 
In the old days, 1918, if you wanted to go a long distance, you took a long distance train, which took a couple days, or uh, you took a steamship. The aircraft hadn't been invented. In fact, Charles Lindbergh didn't make his flight till about nine years, 12 years later. So travel was very slow, and still this thing in 1918, this influenza A strain, managed to circle the world within about three months. Um, this virus has done the same thing. So you have to pre-plan. You have to take this serious. And pre-planning doesn't mean sitting around a long table with everybody drinking coffee and doing a little paper thing. You have, you have to drive the routes. How long does it take? How many miles and how much gasoline does it take to get from the airfield to the warehousing and the time? How much does it take to get to this hospital and to that hospital? If these hospitals start to fill up, where are available unit, uh, buildings I can use and turn these into alternate care sites to take the strain off? Because we have uh, normal people, uninfected, going to a hospital every day. A lot of these surgeries had to be postponed. Uh, it doesn't stop the accidents from happening and the, the necessity for emergency care for, for just day-to-day -day living. So the idea is to try to keep these hospitals functional while we still handle this tremendous surge of, uh, in some cases, very sick patients. And keep in mind, uh, most of the patients of this disease get better. They live. It's just the intensive care patients require a lot of resources, and they're staying on the ventilators for a, a, a good length of time. So pre-planning for this type of thing is essential. Without pre-planning, you've got to get help from outside. And in this case, that means from the federal government. The blame should go to whoever elected the local authorities. That's, that's where the problem is. Just, Dr. Hatchell, I'll ask that question another way. Um, the, I think the specific charge being leveled is that the, the coronavirus or CCP virus, as we're calling it, <laughs> um, wasn't taken seriously enough early enough. You know, I've heard people say two months ago there should have been action and this kind of thing. Well, you can you can sit back an armchair quarterback all you want. I watched this thing develop, and people were taking it seriously way back then. From the time it was still in China, there were preparations underway. Blame the local authorities. You know, you get what you vote for, and. If you don't have a good leader in times like this, well, you voted for him. Blame yourself. This requires, and good leaders seek out the most timely information possible. They're proactive, not reactive. You, you can't be reactive in an epidemic and expect that you're going to keep up with it. Look at it this way. A pandemic affecting the world is really nothing more than a series of little epidemics in local communities. And if the community can handle their own little epidemic, then it's free to handle all the other things, the worker loss, you know, trash collection, making sure food availability, this type of thing. If you can't handle your medical surge or make plans to where you can, then everything overloads, people become scared half to death, and even something that's manageable, it looks like Armageddon. But you have to do the pre-planning and take it seriously. If you don't, you're going to be overloaded. And there are doctors, I know personally, that expect to get infected and uh, maybe die. and they're going in there every day.
That's 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 inc incredible to hear. Um, you know, I'm actually speaking with you from the heart of the pandemic here in uh, near Penn Station in New York City, where our studios are. Um, of course, this is where the vast majority of the cases are and the vast majority of the deaths in America right now. Um, the question is, uh, how serious is this here? Should people be, I mean, this is, should people be panicking? I don't know if this is the right way to ask it, but um, um, what, what should we be thinking here in New York City? Well, look, panic never solved anything. Plus, <laughs> we're Americans. We don't panic. We deal with it. Okay? Panic's not going to do anything. And it's pretty hard to eat toilet paper. You make some rational plans. Um, everybody has good ideas. Nothing wrong with trying to make your ideas known. You move ahead. You gather all the resources you can. And you fight this thing. What else can you do? This will pass, by the way. This is not the Omega Man scenario. This will pass. We'll get through this. There are worse things out there with 50% mortality rates in animal models. These are the ones that are still to come. So this is probably um, our last warning from Mother Nature that uh, we need to take uh, emerging infectious disease and give it the same prominence as we do national defense. There needs to be a centralization for not just local planning efforts, but national planning efforts. We need to be able to model these things in real time uh, right now, nobody knows. Uh, I think the mayor in New York just found some extra ventilators he didn't even know he had. Um, that's not acceptable. There needs to be resource availability. Um, if the government knew how many ventilators, let's say, New Orleans has, and with good real-time reporting information on cases and hospital bed availability, these things can be shoved down there overnight. But it needs a little bit of warning. We need to be able to follow this in real time and jump ahead where we think the next severe situation is going to be and start funneling resources there early. And uh, we, we lack such a system here. Um, there's a CDC Emergency Operations Center, but um, we can do better. We have these things called fusion centers that the military use. And we know how to do these. Uh, if you look at 50 years ago, during the Cold War, we had a, a fusion center called NORAD. We still have NORAD. But it took all this disparate data. It tracked satellites manually. And then the radar stations were built and the, the BMUs line and the DO line and all these separate assets constantly, 24-7, tracking things, looking for bombers or missiles to attack us and all fused down to one board where you could see what was happening at any one time. The military is excellent at doing uh, fusion centers. Well, we need a pandemic fusion center where we're taking data from people that are there, that are on the ground, verifying that, yes, this is seriously a problem. And then we have computer programs now that can project where the next casualties will occur using these. 
centralizing our resources so we can get them from point A to point B. And the U.S. government's done this with the pushbacks from the CDC out of the national stockpile. But we can do even better. We can bring personnel in with these. Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, we're calling a lot of our inactive reserves and active reserves up for duty. These are highly trained men and women. And there's a lot of medics in there, and medics can monitor ventilators. It's, it's fine if I send you, someone sends you 300 ventilators. Well, who are you going to get to run them? Your hospital can surge. You've got RNs and nurse practitioners. You can train your RNs to LPNs to watch the ventilator and call you if there's a problem. So there's a bit of a surge there. But you're dealing with, in some cases, 700% increase in ventilator demand. So you need extra personnel. They don't have to be at the position level uh, to see a light come on and like this is not good or to suction a patient quickly. You can train someone to do that very quickly. But you have to have the personnel. And they have to be very brave people because you're working in a contaminated environment. You know, military are pretty brave people. So these things all need to be thought out ahead of time. Well, my hat goes off to all of these uh, people working on the front lines, all the healthcare workers, all the military, everybody involved. It's just, it's incredible to me, all these people putting themselves in harm's way, like the the medical doctor you described earlier. Um, it's just its just incredible. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions about, you know, sort of in, in our individuals, us, let's say in New York or any other place who that may end up in a situation like New York, you know, um, you've answered this a little bit already, but how important is the social distancing? And then, you know, there's also been reports of how uh, this affects, you know, people that are a lot older disproportionately. Um, so as a young person, you know, how much do I need to care about this? Uh, you know, both of us might know the answer, but I'd like to get your real expert thoughts on this. Well, we're starting to see uh, an increased number of, of young people uh, mm. with, with uh, severe infections. Look, social distancing is vital. I'm sitting here. I'm speaking in front of this microphone. This whole microphone's contaminated. If I, was, if I had anything, this whole microphone's contaminated. And then I touch the microphone, and then I rub my eye, you know, as a new person sitting down here. Well, I just contaminated my finger. I've just put it in the mucosa of my eye. The eye is constantly making tears and they drain through the nasal lacrimal duct. So even if this virus didn't attack my eye, it's going to appear inside my nose. And most respiratory viruses like the inside of the nose. So I just self-inoculated myself. So not only is it important to stay away from that cloud, as you're speaking, there's an invisible cloud around you just from the air coming out of your lungs. So it's important to stay away from the cloud. If you touch a surface, wash your hands before you touch your face or your eyes or the corner of your mouth constantly wiping down surfaces in your work environment, your, your computer, keyboard, just every hour wipe it down. Um, social distancing, at least six feet apart. Three feet is the cloud that I'm creating here. And I've if I had anything, I've contaminated this whole space. So, if you're dealing with the public and this type of thing, physical separation, constant. This virus is killed very quickly by anything, usually uh, anything that contains a, a significant percentage of alcohol, uh, rubbing alcohol, grain alcohol. It dissolves the fatty envelope that that the virus needs to maintain its structure, and and be infective. So. Um, 
this is all we have, but it it does work. Um, and we're down to individual measures now. Um, we've brought things, I think, to as much of a halt as we can. But the people in cases we're seeing now were infected uh, probably seven days before, at least. So there's always a lag. Uh, we saw it in Wuhan. Um, severe, draconian social distancing, locking people in, in their condos. And it was still a number of days before the thing plateaued and started to drop. So we're running behind. We're trying to catch up. We've, this country has done the greatest wartime mobilization since World War II. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch the patriotism of some of these really well-known companies. It's, it's just, it's amazing. Dr. Hatfield, do you think, do you think masks are something that would be useful? There's a lot of d discussion and debate about masks right now. I can give you the basic lowdown on it. A basic surgical mask, the ones you tie or go behind your ears, um, they won't really protect you. The particles that are going to get through the mask are in what's called the one to five micron particle size range. I'm sorry I don't have a video to show you. There's a couple good ones on the internet where they've actually had somebody sneeze or cough and they use the reflected light so you could follow all the particles. Um, you cough, most of these particles are, are large and they fall out of the air fairly quickly within a six foot distance. But there's a very smaller number of one to five micron size particles and these behave essentially as a gas. They stay suspended in the air, the uh, thermal currents off the floor or the heat or whatever, and they waft around. Air currents move them around. Uh, if you open the doors and windows, they tend to go out. But in an enclosed room or a thing like a hospital where the air's kept nice and actually perfect for virus, um, low humidity, you have problems. So that mask will not stop you from inhaling. That will go straight through the surgical mask. Um, you have what we call N95 masks and N100 masks. These have a higher filtration capacity. These are the ones that stick out from your face. And they, they're capable of filtering 95% uh, of anything out there in that particle size range. Remember, you have to have a minimal infective dose uh, to, to become infected. So this filters out the bulk of that. But it leaves your eyes open. So is this a factor in transmission now? We don't know. But it is with other respiratory viruses, including influenza. Um, so wearing the mask uh, the regular surgical mask where it is really good for. Let's say you're one of those people that are infected, but it's still very early and you haven't had a temperature and you don't feel bad at all. And you're going out there, you're going to the supermarket, but you may still be secreting a bit of live virus into the environment. The surgical mask will help that. It stops you from sending those large particles out into the environment should you make a little <coughs> or something like that. Secondly, it reminds you don't touch your face. Don't rub your eyes. So yes, there is a role for them. Yeah. But as a protective device for yourself, it can't be guaranteed. It wasn't in 1918 and it's not now. Would you cut your wrist down? Yes. Yeah. Instead of 100 machine guns shooting at you, you only have one. Does that make sense? Sure.
No, I appreciate that immensely. I mean, essentially, it pr also will provide a, a social service, so to speak, uh, to help transmission, to help prevent transmission. Uh, from what you're saying. Yeah, from an infected person transmitting it to others. Yes, uh, and there's been some studies in college dorm rooms that show, yes, this is the case. Yeah, it does seem to have an effect. You infecting someone else and you're wearing the mask. Again, it's relative. If you're outdoors and there's wind and there's this and that uh, and you're separated, you're not crammed all together on a subway or something, uh, your chances of getting infected are much diminished. There's ultraviolet light during the day, rapidly kills the virus. The problem is indoors and large groups of people. So I think they had spring break in Florida this year. And um, that probably wasn't a good idea. We'll, we'll see what comes out of that. But you had a large number of people crowded together and they disseminated all over the, uh, the east coast and, or east coast and farther. So it's very, very important to avoid large groups. One, from the risk to yourself, and two, if you are infected or have a subclinical infection, um, we're not really sure for how long or before you have symptoms that, that, that uh, you would be infectious to someone else. It looks like it may be a day or so at least. So um, this is all we have. It's essential to keep the total figures down to, they call it flatten the curve now. It's essential to keep it to what our local health authorities can handle. Now, when you flatten the curve, you don't have this huge surge, Armageddon-type science fiction movie stuff, but you have smaller curves. And it actually goes on for a bit longer, a few months longer, the whole scenario rather than getting it over and done with at once. But what did we lose last year, from, or this year, from influenza? Uh, 8,000 to 15,000, I don't know the exact figure. But this was, we do this every year. It's just a matter of course, and it doesn't bring everything to a, to a halt. So moderate numbers of severely medically impaired people can be handled. Uh, overwhelming numbers can't. So the idea is to keep it to the level, the local community to the level that it can handle. And you have to plan for it. Dr. Hatfill, um, based on the response that we're seeing in these large centers and across America now, uh, how long do you expect this to last? And also, you know, are we actually going to flatten the curve? Well, the curve will f flatten itself, if it, you know, eventually. Um, I don't see a plateau yet, just on the general data that's out there. It looks like we're still increasing in cases. And, um, uh, some of our 120 largest cities in the nation are starting to have more and more problems. Um, this is, uh, it's moving fast. So again, we're back to the thing. If we had had a couple weeks warning from China that they were seeing person-to-person -person transmissions and were concerned about it, that would have given us a couple more weeks. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. These things will burn through a community until there's a certain level of what we call herd immunity. People that have uh, either had the disease and have protective antibodies 
where people that have had a very low exposure didn't really catch the disease or had a mild case and have protective antibodies. And this is sort of nature's way. If you go to the Congo and into some of the um, uh, African populations and just draw blood from them, you'll, you, you find a surprising percentage of villagers have antibodies to Ebola, to the Ebola virus. But the village has never had a case of Ebola. Well, this is a herd immunity type thing. There's Ebola in the area, and they'd had a subclinical exposure. Um, but they didn't develop overt disease. And uh, you see it with all kinds of viruses and all types of different animal populations. So uh, no virus ever killed everyone. The science fiction movies are wrong. Uh, doctor, um, recently you're a medical doctor. Um, fairly recently the vice president announced that doctors will be able to prescribe chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine off-label as a treatment for symptoms for, uh, for coronavirus infection. Um, what are your thoughts? I've looked at all the studies. I've looked at the tissue culture studies. I've looked at the limited clinical trials, and you can always argue a clinical trial. Well, it didn't do this, it didn't do that. Uh, the French have done two now with a, with a common antibiotic added. And uh, India has done some. Um, we're doing some. But the data out there and the way that the chloroquine works, it doesn't really work on the virus. Uh, it, it works on you. And uh, I believe my personal thoughts are it does make you more resistant to infection. Uh, the target for the virus, you know, a virus can't enter a cell and it can't replicate on its own. It has to enter a living cell and it becomes the perfect parasite. It hijacks the cell's machinery. To all, all the cell does now is make new viruses until it dies. Well, you need a key to get in. And, uh, the key for this coronavirus is a protein called ACE2. Uh, it's involved in salt and blood pressure control. It's got these little fingers on it, if you will, that have sugar molecules attached to them. And that serves as sort of the catcher's glove for the virus and facilitates its entry into the cell. Well, the chloroquine seems to trim these little fingers off. It makes them kind of stubby. So it's not as good as capturing the virus. In addition, when the virus is brought into the cell, it's surrounded by a vesicle, a, a lipid layer. And the chloroquine seems to make the inside of that uh, vesicle more acidic. So it's like dissolving the virus and the fatty coating. So it's not something that a, 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 this coronavirus can easily adapt and become immune to because it's infecting the person's own cells. And chloroquine has been around for since the 60s. Um, I was in Africa for years. I remember taking, taking it. You don't even know you've had it for most people. The problem is it, it can have some side effects if you have irregular heartbeats. Um, you know, you need to be cleared by your doctor. You don't want to be buying this stuff off the streets. Um, and there's some other conditions, but it's a drug used very commonly for uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus or uh, rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma. So uh, it's available. Uh, some of the hospitals have now brought out protocols for this. Uh, Mount Sinai have brought out a protocol. 
And it's very simple. We, we give you kind of a double dose for two days to get your blood levels up and then something to maintain that therapeutic blood level. And we get this going in your lungs and kidneys. This coronavirus likes to attack your kidneys as well. Uh, there's a lot of these ACE2 receptors in your kidneys. So um, I've looked at the data. I think there's enough evidence there that uh, that uh, it, it it has a useful place and until we can get uh, some of the other drugs that are being tested uh, out there and into a tablet form that would be useful to uh, give to a large number of people. There's a couple, a couple of things out there that are being looked at. Uh, remdesivir. Unfortunately, we have to give that by an IV. But if that can be compounded into a, uh, a tablet form, uh, I looked at the monkey data for this, and uh, it was absolutely astounding. Uh, it appeared to be that effective. So um, chloroquine has a place. Should everybody be taking it prophylactically? No. Should everyone be taking it without a doctor's prescription? No. Not at all. You're going to hurt yourself. I think somebody killed themselves the other day using the tablets to sterilize the fish tank. That is the last thing anyone wants. But should it be made available that a doctor can prescribe it if he thinks it's warranted? I think that's a... Well, doctors can prescribe it anyway for off-label. They can prescribe anything off-label, is my understanding. But they should have that choice. I think there was some governor somewhere that said, oh, no, we're going to outlaw it. Yeah, well, he doesn't have that authority. Who, who the, you know, that's, that's just stupid. I'm sorry. He doesn't have that authority. It's the physicians that take responsibility, both moral and legal, not the governor of a state. How ridiculous. Anyway, I wasn't going to get emotional on this, so trying to stick to the facts. There is a place, I believe, but that is my belief. That's the belief of some doctors. Some doctors don't believe in it. So those are the facts. Some hospitals have put it in their protocol for use for COVID-19. It's a common drug. It's proved over the years to be a safe drug does have side effects. If you use it for a long time, it can permanently damage your eyes. Um, there's a little bit of um, caution if you have irregular heartbeat, which is a lot of our older population of the country. Plus, you have to be extremely careful if you're on some other drugs. So you can see why it has to be prescribed by a p physician. So I wanted to look a little bit about uh, at the international numbers. There's just, I noticed some um, curiosities and I'm wondering if you could speak to them. Uh, namely, you know, we of course know that data is correct, collected differently. And this is, you know, from my background as a researcher, this strikes me as being potentially part of the part of the issue. But for example, okay, looking at the numbers between Italy, Spain, the US and Germany, it looks like compared to the number of cases compared to Italy and Spain, the US death rate is a lot lower. But on the other hand, the German death rate is still a lot lower than that. Uh, what do you make of these numbers? Well, these, these death rates are, are just, uh, uh, it's not something you want to rely on because you're taking a percentage of total number of cases you have in a population. Well, that's unknown. It's unknown unless you test every person in the country a couple times. You don't know how many people are infected. So how do you get a percentage out of that? You're guessing. All these things are guessing. Uh, so, Dr. Hatfield, um, 
We're going to finish up momentarily, and I guess what is your advice here to Americans and people around the world um, going forward, and officials? We'll get through this. We'll find a way. It is going to be a bit messy in some areas that haven't done preparation. Well, that's not the federal government's fault. Uh, that's your fault, those leaders. This is probably, I'm guessing, our last warning before the real thing comes. And that will most probably be a respiratory virus with a 40% uh, or higher mortality. So we're learning what's working, what doesn't work. Um, we got a lot to work to do in the in the future to get ready for this. It will come. It will. So we need to be ready for it. It is a question of national defense. So essentially, um, you're saying take this opportunity to get everything in place, both personally and at a um, institution level, at the government level. Um, for whatever else is out there. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is our last warning. So we need to be ready for the other one. And this starts with getting an effective global surveillance system in place. You know, most of the disease outbreaks, uh, you can pick up just through the uh, country's local media and the twits and the social media, twits, twitters, whatever. Um, these can be data mined automatically. Searching the world's social media for indications of outbreaks of infectious disease. We've had something called ProMed up and running for 20 years now where uh, Doctors will report unusual disease outbreaks. And these things work. Uh, the WHO run on, on a media data mining sun, uh, system invented by the Canadians. It's very good. It had picked up the 2003 SARS thing several weeks before uh, the Chinese announced it. Well, why not get really good at global surveillance and actually putting boots on the ground in these suspected outbreaks to physically see what's going on and linking that into a response system and a stockpile and all these things that we've seen with this outbreak, but really taking it seriously, taking the pulse of the world hour by hour, if you will, for... Uh, emerging infectious diseases and responding within hours rather than weeks. This is, this is doable with our technology. Let's start leveraging this. Well, this is a, a bit of a testament to the importance of free and open information. Um, and yet there are countries <laughs> where that just simply isn't available because it's politicized, like in China. Yep. Um, the other factor is war zones. You know, Democratic Republic of the Congo is a, is a good example. With the Ebola, I think they've finally got it under control there. But we couldn't get people in there to determine what was actually happening on the ground. So you need to have some teams able to do things like that, to go into a conflict area and see, is there an epidemic going on here? Take samples and learn early on what it is. Uh, visitation teams, we do this for nuclear weapons. You have international inspection teams. It's time for the WHO to do something and get some international uh, disease inspection teams is where 
one signatory country has indications that another signatory country is having an unusual outbreak, these international teams should be allowed to immediately go in and confirm. Every week is important with this type of stuff. So until we have something like that, we have to assume things like this will happen again. Well, Dr. Hatfill, it's such a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for taking the time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.